Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is our, our Eastman's ninth annual Black History Month oratorical contest. I'm really glad we've been able to have this event in person again. Um, I think it's a really big success. It's a really positive uh, event for the community, and it really showcases the, the intelligence and the talent that our local high school students have. So uh, my name is Andrew Synth. I'm part of the Black History Month planning team. Um, and that's really enough about me, but please allow me to introduce Tanya Foreman, who is the Connect ERG Global Chair, to make some opening remarks. Welcome to all of you, our Connect members, to the judges, um, and to our parents and families of our presenters. I think it was Maya Angelou who said, the more you know of your history, the more liberated you are. Black history, it's our history. And these students chose to participate, and that's very admirable because you're making history as you're sharing your knowledge of history. So thank you so much for being here. So I have a few instructions, so put your listening ears on. The students will be coming to present their essays. We are recording this event, and it's going to be a part of our overall oratorical contest with our other sites. So this is what I need you to do. When their names are announced, feel free to give them the biggest applause you can. Let them come to the stage. We're going to record them and their delivery. When they finish, I know you're going to be tempted to immediately applause, but Hold your applause until you see Brad over here. He's going to tell you when you can applause because what we want to do is have a seamless presentation when we record these and we put them on social media and places like that. So y'all got that? There you go. I want to say a big thank you to the schools and the the representatives, the teachers at the schools who encourage the students to participate and have done that for the past nine years. We have learned of new people that we didn't know about and we've heard of some that we've always known about. But this is really awesome for these kids to have an experience to research, learn about someone, and be able to share that. So what I would like for you to do is first of all, Give a big round of applause for all of our teachers and schools. We also want to thank the parents and families of these students. It takes a lot of courage to get up here and talk in front of people. And so we want to celebrate them, and we want them to certainly be able to do their best. So thank you also to the families for supporting your students and continuing to support this program. Thanks. Before we jump into the main action, I figured I'd give you a little bit of history on this contest and you know how long we've been doing it. As you heard me say, this is our ninth annual year, um, or our ninth year really, uh, putting on this contest. Um, we started back in 2015 with, I think, 15 or so essays. Um, this year, we had almost 80 essays submitted in just the Tri-Cities region. So that's a real big plus, and we love to see the engagement with all our students. But more than just here in Tri-Cities, you know, we've uh, expanded to five of our manufacturing sites. So this will be the fourth year for our uh, Longview in Texas site, our Mar uh, Martinsville, Virginia site, and the second year for our Texas City, Texas site, and our Indian Orchard, Massachusetts sites. So um, over the years, we've had over 800 essays submitted. We've been able to give almost four, uh, over $40,000 worth of scholarship to these students. So uh, really happy to give back to the community and really uh, happy to see all the research that these students have done. But uh, as you can imagine, this is uh, no small task. You know, we have all these essays come in, and we need to be able to field them before we can pick out who our uh, finalists are going to be to give these presentations. So uh, real major uh, thanks to all of our volunteers, um, both Eastman uh, employees and not, who took the time to read through and rank these essays and help us rank these students and understand uh, or get a better idea of 
who did the work to get to this point. So uh, enough talking from me, let's get to the, the action really. So uh, I wanted to highlight our five judges um, up here in the first row. First we have Janae Williams, she's a strategy analyst here at Eastman. Next we have Valerie Lawrence, she's a legal associate here at Eastman. Next we've got Sandy Harris, a contract specialist. Then Tina Wilmer, a global trade compliance governance lead. And finally, Candace Robinson, an environmental representative. So once again, thank you to our uh, judges for helping us to put on this event and showcase our students. And then finally, uh, here comes our students. We've got five students today who will be presenting on a number of uh, important contributors to STEAM or science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. First up, we've got Sadie Cheshire. She's a 10th grader from Dobbins Bennett High School. Sadie? Do you ever get frustrated at a stoplight, like when you're in a hurry and you have to wait your turn to go? But then you read about a tragedy where someone runs a red light and T-bones the other driver, killing them instantly. Like them or not, stoplights are here to protect us, thanks to the African-American inventor, Garrett Augustus Morgan. From his earliest beginnings, Morgan had to overcome hardships of poverty, his lack of education, he only completed school to the fifth grade, racial discrimination, and prejudice. Even with the challenging obstacles in his life, they did not defeat him. He continued to improve not only his life, but the lives of others. But how? How did Morgan enhance the safety of others? Well, he invented two life-saving inventions, the gas mask and the yellow caution light. Morgan's gas mask was born out of a tragic fire in 1911. Hearing that the leading cause of death was the inhalation of poisonous smoke, he came to realize that those lives could have been spared. Thus, it inspired Morgan to create a mask for the prevention of breathing the deadly smoke. The mask would later be involved and used in World War I. However, it had its ultimate test when Morgan saved 20 lives trapped in a tunnel under Lake Erie. Although the action was heroic and should have brought him respect and recognition, he was hit hard with racial challenges. People refused to buy his beneficial product. They did not recognize his life-saving measures, and newspapers failed to record accurate information of the event. Nevertheless, Morgan persevered. He did not demand equality, but rose for the truth to be known by establishing his own newspaper called the Cleveland Call. Not only was, his, was Morgan's gas mask born out of devastation, but his warning light on stoplights was too. After witnessing a car crash, noticing overcrowded streets, and figuring out that manual traffic signals were ineffective and causing collisions, Morgan came to realize that he could invent a caution light as an additional feature to his present day light. In doing so, it would have the ability of upgrading intersections by protecting cars and carriages in a much safer and more effective way. Saving millions of lives. Later, Morgan's influence would, would be an example to other inventors who helped develop the stoplight that you see today. So the next time you see a yellow light, stop and think about Garrett Morgan's work he did 100 years ago and the impact it has on you today. History has shown us that Morgan was an inventor who shaped the world as it is today. History also teaches us that it was not an easy road for Morgan to accomplish those great acts of service. So, we can conclude that Garrett Augustus Morgan was one of our most significant but forgotten heroes. From the beginning, Morgan had to pull himself up and learn to face life's storms. Through it all, his determination and forgiving spirit toward those who wronged him overruled the discrimination he faced during his lifetime. His reputation, compassion, steadfastness, and perseverance would prove him to be a great inventor as well as a hero to all. 
I think it is fitting that I am sharing the life and story of Garrett Augustus Morgan here at Eastman today because he demonstrated the same zero incident mindset that this company strives to demonstrate in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadie. Great job. Our next student is Rashab Day, also a 10th grader from Dobbins Bennett. Rashab? You've probably heard of the big time Silicon Valley inventors. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates and co. Well, here in Tennessee, we have Mark Dean. Mark Dean is a computer scientist and engineer who showed that success knows no race and one whose work is instrumental in our daily lives. Despite the challenges he faced in his journey, he overcame the hardships and made critical innovations in the field of computer science. His work has awarded him three patents for the original IBM PC, Black Engineer of the Year President's Award, and so many others. His work includes inventing the colored PC monitor, the first gigahertz chip, industry standard architecture for printers, speakers, and disk drives, and he was even a part of IBM's team which made its first personal computer. He did all of this while representing Tennessee and the African American community in the growing field of technology. Mark Dean has fundamentally changed the field of computer science and his contribution to our lives cannot be understated. Born in Morristown, Tennessee, not far from Kingsport, Mark Dean grew up with a problem-solving brain. He excelled at math, learning topics at a fourth grade level while only in first grade. He once stated, I couldn't read worth a darn, but all I cared about was math anyways. However, he faced challenges in his educational journey. The school he attended was segregated. He and his other African-American classmates were confined into one classroom. Once, after desegregation, a student claimed he was quote-unquote too smart to be black. Mark concluded that a large problem was that the assumption about what African Americans could do was tilted. He would go on to challenge that assumption. After graduating high school, he attended the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where he majored in electrical engineering and graduated at the top of his class in 1979. And after graduating, he landed his dream job at IBM and moved down to Boca Raton, Florida to the IBM campus. He got his master's degree in electrical engineering from Florida Atlantic University in 1982. Back at IBM, his first major career breakthrough came when he was on the team that made IBM's first personal computer. This was massive as it revolutionized home and small business computing. And working with a colleague, Dennis Moeller, he was able to in invent industry standard architecture used to connect things like printers, speakers, disk drives, and modems to your computer. After the success, IBM sent him to, sent him to Stanford to get a PhD in electrical engineering. Mark has cited this time at Stanford at helping him climb the corporate ladder in a time when few African Americans were given this opportunity. He was able to lead high profile projects, which partnered with the likes of Motorola and Apple. Shortly after, he invented the colored PC monitor, which was a technological breakthrough for his time. A few years later, he was given the title of IBM Fellow, the highest technical ranking at the company. A few years later in Austin, 1995, his team invented the first gigahertz chip, which is able to do more than a billion calculations per second. More recently, in the early 2000s, he predicted the rise of mobile devices, and considering we all carry one of these in our pocket, I think he was correct. Mark Dean's contribution to the field of computer science cannot be understated, and he's had a long-lasting impact on this world. Although it may be easy to glance over his achievements, it's important to remember them and celebrate them for what he did. There are not that many people who you can guarantee have had an impact on the lives of millions, but Mark, yeah, he's one of them. He's commented on the fact that he's faced occasional racism in his life, but he said like anything else, there was nothing he couldn't just run right through or go around. Mark showed that success knows no color. Not, what, not only was he a computer scientist and engineer, he was a world-changing trailblazer who powered and brightened the 21st century. Thank you. Our next student is Lily Gould a 10th grader from Dobbins Bennett. Music has been evolving since the beginning of time. Whether it was a shift in style, a change in the most popular genre, or even a simple adjustment to the trending background beats. Many musicians have come and gone, leaving their mark on this continuously progressing timeline. One of them being Jimi Hendrix, the man who permanently changed how the electric guitarist played. In his much too short-lived career, Hendrix would become one of the most well-known, influential guitarists to ever live, and without him, the rock and roll music we all know and love would probably be drastically different. Hendrix was born on November 27, 1942, in Seattle, Washington. As a child, 
He was very creative and resourceful, partaking in musical activities, including strumming a broom and playing a one-string ukulele. And even though this wasn't much, it allowed him to develop his rhythmic tone. He was given his first acoustic guitar at age 11, and one year later, his first electric. As said in Baker's Biographical Dictionary of Musicians, he didn't really receive any formal training on the instrument until he joined the Army, where he was given the opportunity to practice with many different musicians with many different backgrounds. From here, he would go on to pursue his passion for music. After some time in the industry, Hendrix was asked to join the singer John Hammond Jr.'s group. He accepted the honorable invite. However, the group only lasted a few weeks because according to Hammond himself, even before Hendrix got big, he was his own star. This is a fitting description, seeing as how Jimi Hendrix didn't just play the electric guitar. He practically reinvented it. He pushed the boundaries of his very limited selection of equi equipment. As said, in contemporary musicians, he was able to manipulate the tone and volume controls to produce what was at the time otherworldly effects. He also popularized the use of bar chords, which give you the ability to change the key as many times as you want in a song. For an example of this, I'm sure many of you have heard of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. So, in this song, in the final chorus of it, you will notice that there is an alteration in sound. This is the key change. So if you take this, you put it multiple times in a song, then you've got exactly what bar chords allow you to do. And before Hendrix, this was basically completely unheard of. On top of his incredible guitar stills, he also had an incredible guitar. He played a right-handed Fender Stratocaster that was reconfigured to be played left-handed. A Stratocaster is a type of electric guitar that has a different tone from other electric guitars due to the greater number of pickups. Basically, a pickup is what makes the electric guitar actually be electric. He would then go on to have this incredible stage presence. He pulled off inhuman stunts that were unheard of for his time. Many artists today continue to look up to him. One of his most famous displays was his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner in Woodstock, 1969. Music doesn't lie. If there needs to be a change in this world, then it can only happen through music. Jimi Hendrix. Joe Taysom, an author from Far Out Magazine, explains that through the one performance, through the use of just his instrument, he was able to make one of the greatest political statements in music history. The anthem wasn't performed in the most orthodox way, which sent waves through the country, and it is still talked about. Not many artists are able to accomplish this kind of publicity during their careers, let alone after. Now, let's actually talk about some songs. Jimi Hendrix's band, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, released many, many records while he was alive. Some of their most popular songs were Hey Joe, If Six Was Nine, and All Along the Watchtower. Later on, Hendrix also formed the all-African-American band, Band of Gypsies. Some of their notable songs were Who Knows and Machine Gun. However, only a few months after the creation of this band, Hendrix died of an overdose. Yet, even after death, his legacy continues. Contemporary Musicians mentions that Hendrix had several unreleased songs that producers would go on to drop every couple of years. The most recent, Angel, was actually just released this past November. And there are still a number of fans who are very, very keen to listen, showing how much of an impact Hendrix had over all of them. In his very brief, four-year-long career, Hendrix managed to completely alter how the electric guitar is played and completely change how artists following him would perform at concerts. Many musicians, including myself, continue to take inspiration from him today. He paved the way for music, which goes to show why Jimi Hendrix's name has been written in the musical history books. Thank you. Our next student is Reed Haas, a junior from Westridge High School. Uh, hello, I'm Reed Haas. I'm representing Westridge High School. Uh, you know, when I started researching some people to see if I'd be interested in doing this competition, um, I saw a lot of, you know, normal faces online, you know, a doctor, or a professor, or an inventor. And then somebody caught my eye, and his name is Stefan Alexander. He is a professor, but he's unlike any professor that I've ever heard of before. So Stefan Alexander was born in Trinidad in the Caribbean in 1971. Uh, in a kind of a lower class life, he was born in a small town, and his parents knew that they could find better opportunity for him in the United States. So when Stefan was eight years old, uh, his family packed up and moved to the Bronx. 
Um, Stefan was kind of unhappy with the move all the way up until high school. He was kind of a middling student. Um, he didn't accomplish that much, and that was until one day during high school. He was walking into the very first day of his new physics class. He had never taken physics before. Um, and his teacher, Mr. Kaplan, once everyone had sat down, he tossed a tennis ball into the air. And he asked a basic question. He said, right before the tennis ball landed back into my hand, what was the velocity? And Stefan immediately, despite ne having never taken physics, he raised his hand and he gave the correct answer. And Kaplan said the intuition was the lifeblood of a great physicist. And he invited um, Alexander back into his office later that day. And they talked about Kaplan's two favorite um, possessions. The first one actually was a John Coltrane album that he had. Um, Alexander was a saxophonist and he was able to relate with Kaplan on that idea of jazz. And the second one was this huge physics textbook. And Kaplan said to Alexander, he gave him the book and he said, I don't want you to stop studying until you understand every word of this book. And Alexander loved physics so much from that day that that's exactly what he did. He excelled all the way through high school um, and he earned a full ride to Haverford College. He spent four years there getting his bachelor's degree in physics. Uh, he graduated with his bachelor's. He wrote his thesis on the Barkhausen effect. Um, and then he decided he wanted his master's degree. So he moved on to Brown University. And he got his master's degree, uh, first of all, in physics, but also in electrical engineering, which was uh, interesting. And then he pursued his master's degree. And finally, he ran into some adversity. You know, he had excelled all the way through college, but he ran into the very difficult aspects of his college career, and he was increasingly isolated from his peers. He wasn't like anyone else. He was a tall black saxophonist with dreads. He wasn't like anyone else, and he was increasingly moved away. And eventually, he worsened to the point where at his midterm exam, he could not answer a single question. So, depressed, he decided to go back home. Uh, he briefly moved back to the Bronx and visited with his parents, but then he went back to his true home uh, in Trinidad. He spent some time there healing. Um, he visited with his grandparents. He visited with uh, some places of his childhood that were his favorites. And while he was there, he actually brought a few textbooks from his courses. And just there, kind of on the beach or wherever he was relaxing, he read them. And he finally started learning in that environment his purpose, he moved back to the United States after about two years in Trinidad, and he aced his exams, and he graduated with his master's degree in 2000. He wrote his master's thesis on string theory, um, which at the time was a very, very revolutionary idea. Um, from then on, he moved to the Imperial College in London, not as a student for once, but as a staff member. He co-invented a universal expansion model, um, and he also joined a jazz group while he was there and interacted with many great jazz musicians. Uh, he didn't spend much time in the UK. He moved back and actually joined the Particle Accelerator staff at Stanford. Um, from there, he actually decided to pursue his icon, Mr. Kaplan's profession. He decided to become a teacher. So in 2005, he was accepted as an assistant professor to Penn State. Uh, he didn't spend very long there. He moved back, uh, back to his roots at Haverford, but this time he was teaching. Uh, and then finally, he got a head professor job at Brown University, where he works to this day. Um, he's been honored by National Geographic. He is currently the president of the National Society of Black Physicists. So I haven't really talked about something that I mentioned um, a little bit briefly, which was Alexander's jazz interests. But it's actually vital to understanding how he thinks about physics. Because in his main theory of the universe, it started with him asking the question, what if the universe was like a jazz solo? Um, now that might sound a little bit insane to start off with, um, but I'm actually a saxophonist myself. And the way a jazz solo works is you have the soloist is allowed to try different rhythmic ideas over the same repeated chord structure. So applying that to the universe, Alexander's idea was that you have different laws of physics each time the universe was created. Um, and he actually used that idea in Einstein's equations, and he says that the math actually works out. And since then, it's become one of the leading theories on the universe. So what have we learned from uh, Stefan Alexander? Well, we learned that sometimes it's okay to go back to your roots, stay determined, and think outside the box. Thank you. And our final student is Ada Hilton a junior from Tennessee High School. 
Dr. Margaret S. Collins was difficult to find. She was buried beneath offhandedly cited research papers and politicians sharing her last name. No world biographies even mentioned her name. No reference books included her as an African-American woman in science. So when I found that she was a hero to the entomology community, even dubbed as the termite lady for ex extensive achievements, the true startling nature of her erasure became a sore thumb amidst her shining achievements. Margaret S. Collins remains woefully underrecognized for her unique contributions to the field of entomology and her story truly is one of dedication and perseverance. Margaret S. Collins was born in Institute, West Virginia on September 4th, 1922. She lived with her parents, Rollins and Luella James, who instilled curiosity and adventurous nature and independence into her early life. Due to her father's position as a professor of agriculture at West Virginia State College, Collins had access to the college library and as a result, developed a voracious passion for literature. At home, she was often found playing in the woods beside her house or exploring a nearby barn. Her elementary school identified her as a child prodigy at age six, and she graduated high school at age 14, bypassing four years of education to study at West Virginia State College and nurturing her career at a historically black college. After she received her undergraduate and master's in biology, she transferred to the University of Chicago. Collins began to work towards a PhD in entomology, but she struggled in finding a mentor. And she found Alfred E. Emerson, who maintained the largest termite collection in the world. However, he claimed women were annoying during field work. Due to this, she never embarked on research trips, working exclusively in the lab, and would not discover her passion for fieldwork until later. She graduated the university in 1950, her doctoral thesis on termites published as a foundational text for entomologists around the world. Following her graduation, Collins quickly fell in love with fieldwork. She conducted revolutionary entomological studies in eight countries throughout North and South America. She accumulated a diverse collection of termites, which became her career specialty, earning her the title, the termite lady. She was a trailblazer in her field, even co-discovering a new species, a dampwood termite residing in Florida. She worked as a professor at three universities throughout her career, and during her employment at Florida A&M University, Collins went on leave for her academic career and dedicated those years to civil rights activism. She participated in the Tallahassee bus boycott, driving protesters to work despite threats from the police and the FBI. She later returned to the lab, but continued to apply her activism to her academic career in her symposium, Science and the Question of Human Equality. Collins cared for two sons and was a single mother living off a less than adequate academic salary, but financial challenges could not extinguish her love of family. She passed away from congestive heart failure at age 73 during her trip to the Cayman Islands in 1996. Her legacy lives on through her research. Over 300,000 pages of her research papers can be found at the Biodiversity Heritage Library, and her extensive termite collection is stored at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Her academic status gave her a soapbox to bring attention to misogyny and racism in the workplace, and her unique contributions shed light onto the mysterious world of termites. The field of entomology is often misunderstood, just like the insect subjects it studies, but Collins found a special place in her heart for the strange and unexplored. Near the end of her life, Dr. Collins summarized her experiences in academic activism and detailed what legacy she hoped to leave behind. We can do little for those of us who have been so conditioned that they back away when the opportunity to stand tall is offered, except be thankful that we are not all as they are. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Crumsey Ford. I'm a sustainability manager here at Eastman and I will be announcing our winners, our rankings. Um, joining us as the students come up to accept their award, they'll be joined by Paula Bulkeo, who is our Director of Public Affairs, as well as our President of Connect, um, Tanya Foreman, and Andrew Yacinth, who's been hosting our contest. Um, so if, as I call your name, our winners, if you'll come up to my right and take, take a photo and receive your check and celebrate with your family, 
that'll be great. All right, so fifth place goes to Reed Hass. Congratulations, Reed. All right, great job. Thanks so much. Fourth place goes to Ada Hilton. Congratulations, Ada. <laughs> awesome job. Third place goes to Lily Gould. Welcome. Our two finalists, uh, close, close race. Our runner up for this year's contest is Rashab Day. <laughs> Great job, Rashab. She's already dancing in her seat. So Sadie, <laughs> go come on up here. Congratulations. So just, just as a reminder, everybody that came today was a winner. Um, so we'll ask all of them to come up and get a photo um, with our Eastman team members and just thank them again for amazing work.